Item Number SCP-1225 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures SCP-1225 is kept within its original packing, including styrofoam padding, in an isolated room measuring 15 meters by 15 meters by 15 meters at Site-37. SCP-1225 is kept in a locked stainless steel box on a concrete pestle that is protected from the elements, in a 25 meter by 25 meter roofless containment area open to the air in at least a 180 degree arc. Unless part of an experiment, no sealed or closed containers are allowed within the containment area, including pockets and clothing and end caps on pins. Personnel should spend no more than 60 minutes per 24 hour period within the containment area. SCP-1225 is a spindle-shaped glass ornament with a small loop at the top allowing it to be hung from a hook. When hung on a tree, bush, or other woody plant, it initiates a process of accelerating decay and aging in any closed containers within 4 meters of it. The contents of these containers will change so as to reflect the signs of typical wear and tear that the object would acquire over the course of several years. Textiles, clothing, and stuffed plush animals become faded and threadbare, often with ripped seams and missing or broken fasteners. Solid-state metal, plastic, or glass objects will display chips, cracks, scratches, and heavy corrosion similar to acid burns. Electronics display both hardware and software problems, sufficient to cause fatal shutdowns within a few minutes of use. Foodstuffs will become stale or moldy. Living organisms do not die, but display health problems consistent with age, as well as extended malnourishment, neglect, or abuse. The decay process is rapid, with affected objects displaying approximately one year's worth of aging within the first 24 hours of exposure. However, the rate of decay slows over time and asymptotically approaches a maximum of approximately ten years' worth of aging over the course of three weeks. Addendum 1225-D Study of SCP-1225's pre-containment circumstances, as well as experimentation regarding the aging effects of long-term exposure to SCP-1225, indicate that SCP-1225 is a secondary effect. Any individuals that spend more than 4 hours per 24-hour period within 10 to 12 meters of SCP-1225 begin to display increased levels of aggression, anger and irritability, decreased patience and frustration tolerance, an exaggeration of negative or annoying personal traits, such as overeating, alcohol consumption, snoring, and unpleasant body odor. This effect persists even when the affected individuals are no longer within range of SCP-1225, but gradually fades over the course of eight days. This increase in aggravating factors typically results in heightened levels of interpersonal conflict, most commonly expressed by severe verbal or physical fights. When more than one individual affected by SCP-1225 interact with each other, the effects are much more severe and escalate much faster. In 27.5% of cases, this results in serious injuries or fatalities. Addendum 1225-H Due to a statistically abnormal amount of equipment failure, structural decay, and interpersonal conflicts requiring administrative action at Site-37. More in-depth studies were performed on SCP-1225. The current prevailing theory is that SCP-1225 still operates, even when not placed on a plant, but much slower and less intensely. It appears to treat enclosed structures or buildings containing it as if they were containers placed beneath it, and will affect them as well. Whether or not the containing structure includes a roof, trellis, or other overhead cover appears to most strongly determine whether or not SCP-1225 will affect the structure. The acquisition of D-Class personnel from SCP-784 is currently under consideration due to the fact that these personnel are less prone to equipment failures caused by SCP-1225. Further research is required in order to determine the exact nature of this effect. Containment protocols have been updated. Item number SCP-784 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures 
SCP-784 has been disguised as a gated community, and is currently surrounded by a 3.5 meter high, 0.8 meter thick concrete wall to deter intrusion. The top of the wall is lined with electrified steel cable, and the gate is to be locked. Any non-Foundation personnel attempting to enter SCP-784 are not to be interfered with, due to the possibility of provoking a violent reaction from the occupants of SCP-784. Non-Foundation personnel exiting SCP-784 are to be detained, questioned, and released following administration of a Class B amnestic. Foundation personnel entering SCP-784 are to be dressed in traditional Christmas wear prior to entering SCP-784. The area composing SCP-784 is to be monitored remotely by a Foundation-controlled weather balloon. In the event that personnel are required to enter SCP-784, all involved personnel must have memorized the entire contents of the Beginner's Guide to Christmas Carols. They are to be checked for precision prior to entering SCP-784. Due to SCP-784's proximity to suburban housing developments, as well as the ramifications of provoking SCP-784-1, patrols within SCP-784 are to be unarmed except during a Noel event. In the case of an unexpected Noel event, members of SCP-784-1 are to be restrained as non-violently as possible while Foundation personnel prepare Procedure 784-C. SCP-784 is a neighborhood in the town of Texas. Currently, SCP-784 is made up of 24 houses and two apartment buildings, all of which are decorated with brand Christmas lights at a density of approximately 15 lights per square meter of housing. SCP-784 will always be covered by between 12 and 33 centimeters of snow, though no unseasonable weather will occur above SCP-784. All houses within SCP-784 are occupied by a variable number of instances of SCP-784-1. SCP-784-1 is composed mostly of adult humans, all of whom wear sweaters typically associated with holiday gift-giving. The number of unique instances of SCP-784-1 within SCP-784 has been estimated at 300. Instances of SCP-784-1 have not been observed engaging in reproductive activity, and no instances of SCP-784-1 have ever observably been born within SCP-784. Instances of SCP-784-1 appear to age normally though the death of an instance of SCP-784-1 has never been observed by Foundation personnel. All instances of SCP-784-1 express traits commonly associated with Christmas spirit throughout the year. These traits include singing of Christmas carols, performance of plays commonly associated with the birth of Christ, and various eggnog-related festivities. These activities are engaged in daily. Those specific activities will never repeat more than once per week. During daylight hours, instances of SCP-784-1 will engage in activities such as gift exchanges and home decoration. Post-sunset activities include decorating of foreign objects, as well as vandalism, which is typically holiday-themed. A Foundation supply convoy refueling overnight near SCP-784 attracted an unprecedented response from SCP-784-1, which proceeded to egg several in-transit prefabricated buildings, convert a Humvee into a sleigh, replace a shipment of fragmentation grenades with similar appearing glass ornaments, fill the gas tank of several vehicles with brand eggnog, weld steel antlers onto 156 safety helmets. Any living creature with an SCP-784 not viewed as displaying adequate Christmas spirit will become the focus of all instances of SCP-784-1 within approximately 4 meters. In the case of an animal, instances of SCP-784-1 will be called from the nearest house and place a holiday-themed accessory on the focus. Observed decorations have included 15 collars, red with a small bell, seven reindeer antlers, five red Santa hats, one full-body reindeer holiday outfit. 
Human subjects who do not meet SCP-784's criteria for Christmas spirit will be assaulted by SCP-784-1, incapacitated, and forcibly directed into the nearest household. They will not be seen until the following day, when they will exit the household dressed similarly to other instances of SCP-784-1. Attempts to retrieve affected personnel have been met with great resistance on both the part of SCP-784-1 and the affected individual. The criteria which SCP-784 follows for definition of Christmas spirit appears to be extremely broad. See Addendum 784-A for a complete log of personnel abducted and assumed reasons for abduction. Approximately once per month, SCP-784-1 will attempt to exit SCP-784 and enter the surrounding suburban community. This is referred to by on-site personnel as a Noel event. During a Noel event, each instance of SCP-784-1 will carry a string of Christmas lights estimated to be 15 meters long. Instances of SCP-784-1 will attach these lights to any nearby house, which will become decoratively and functionally identical to all other houses within an SCP-784. Signs of an incoming Noel event include increased festivity during the day preceding the event, excessive eggnog consumption by a significant portion of SCP-784-1, and an increase in the number of decorations present within SCP-784. Procedure 784-C is to be executed prior to the occurrence of a Noel event. Foundation personnel are to dress themselves in traditional Santa outfits and distribute themselves near the exit of SCP-784. They are to begin singing Good King Winsolus and distributing non-alcoholic eggnog to other personnel. On the arrival of SCP-784-1, personnel are to distribute eggnog mixed with a mild sedative to the crowd. Personnel are to appear friendly and cheerful at all times, as SCP-784-1 is proven capable of abducting personnel while nearly unconscious. Following the distribution of eggnog, personnel are encouraged to sing carols associated with peace and goodwill. Silent Night has proven most effective. Instances of SCP-784-1 will begin to sing along, and personnel are to accept their choice of song. SCP-784-1 will begin to fall unconscious as the night progresses. Unconscious instances of SCP-784-1 will be removed to nearby houses by other instances, and personnel are not to interfere with this process. Any interference with the actions of SCP-784-1 may trigger a violent response and will wake all instances of SCP-784-1. Instances of SCP-784-1 not affected by Procedure 784-C are to be silently incapacitated with no longer visible from the gates of the community, and returned after all other instances of SCP-784-1 have re-entered SCP-784. In the event that Procedure 784-C fails, Foundation personnel are to release an aerosolized sleeping gas. Foundation personnel are to restrain instances of SCP-784-1 until the gas takes effect, at which time all instances are to be returned to SCP-784. Standard Cover Story 139, Drunken Football, is to be used to respond to any concerns expressed by nearby residents. Addendum Addendum 784-A Action taken by personnel Action taken by SCP-784-1 Agent Paulson, on patrol within SCP-784, wished a nearby instance of SCP-784-1 happy holidays. Approximately eight instances of SCP-784-1 surrounded Paulson, who was unable to escape. Paulson was dragged into a nearby home. Agent Matthews sang the incorrect verse of Silent Night while on night patrol with an SCP-784. Multiple instances of SCP-784-1 incapacitated Matthews non-violently using a nearby string of decorative lights. Attempted intervention by Agent Sanderson led to the involvement of a large crowd of SCP-784-1, which overwhelmed both agents. Matthews and Sanderson were dragged into a nearby home, after which personnel reported hearing the sound of Christmas carols from within the home for several days. 
Agent Anderson collided with a lawn ornament, apparently a Santa in the style of a traditional lawn gnome. Anderson proceeded to swear violently for the next 14 seconds. Three nearby instances of SCP-784-1 held Anderson in place. A fourth emerged from a nearby home with a quart of eggnog, which Anderson was forced to ingest. Anderson collapsed and was dragged into the home from which the eggnog was retrieved. Agent Davis was presented with a gift by a child instance of SCP-784-1. Davis accepted the gift, but apparently failed to react with proper enthusiasm. Davis was incapacitated by a child instance of SCP-784-1 which tackled his legs. Several children emerged from a nearby home before Davis recovered, and then dragged Davis into the home which they had exited. Item number SCP-4666 Object Class Keter Special Containment Procedures Web traffic and law enforcement channels worldwide are to be monitored for evidence of SCP-4666 activity, and particularly for cases of stalking or reports of anomalous phenomena involving families with young children. Should a vice knocked event be suspected to be in progress, the nearest containment task force is to be dispatched to attempt containment of SCP-4666. Standard PDP-7 humanoid first contact protocols apply. Media coverage of family deaths attributed to SCP-4666 is to be suppressed or falsified to make said deaths appear as non-anomalous home invasion murders. Forensic evidence in SCP-4666-A instances collected by non-Foundation agencies are to be confiscated and witnesses amnesticized. SCP-4666 is currently believed to be a single, exceptionally long-lived humanoid entity of unknown origin. Survivors of Weissnacht events typically describe SCP-4666 as a very tall, between 2 meters and 2.3 meters elderly male of European descent, with an extremely emaciated appearance. The entity always appears completely naked, even when observed outdoors in freezing weather. Though the nature and extent of its anomalous properties remain uncertain, SCP-4666 appears capable of instantaneous or near-instantaneous travel to any location north of 40 degrees north latitude, and possibly to any location on Earth. SCP-4666 activity occurs exclusively within a period of 12 consecutive nights every year, from the night of December 21st to the 22nd to the night of January 1st to the 2nd. This period is known as SCP-4666's active phase. During this phase and what are termed Weissnacht events, SCP-4666 will appear at dwellings in one or multiple locations north of 40 degrees north latitude. In all known Weissnacht events, these dwellings have shared the following characteristics. Isolated rural location, home to a family with at least one child under the age of eight and situated in an area with snow cover lasting throughout the duration of the event. Weissnacht events consist of the following general progression. Nights 1-7 through seven, Children will report seeing SCP-4666 in the vicinity of their family's dwelling. The entity will typically be observed watching the dwelling from a distance, such as from across a nearby field or from the edge of a neighboring forest. In some cases, Children will report waking up at night to find SCP-4666 watching them sleep through a window. Nights 8-11 through 11, Family members, including the parents, will report sounds of footsteps coming from the roof or the attic. An extremely unpleasant odor will also frequently be noticed inside the dwelling. No cause for these phenomena will be found. As a result, parents will often begin to suspect that their family is being stalked, or even that their dwelling might be haunted. Night 12. Over the course of the night, one of two scenarios will occur. The first and most common is that SCP-4666 will kill all members of the family, save for one child under the age of eight, whom it will abduct. SCP-4666 will inflict incapacitating injuries to family members while they are sleeping, then herd them into a single room of the dwelling where it will proceed to kill them in view of each other. 
The method of killing varies with the event, and will typically be preceded by some form of torture, which appears to serve a ritualistic purpose. See Weissnacht events log below. In the second scenario, which has occurred in roughly 15% of known Weissnacht events, SCP-4666 will not harm the family. Family members will report hearing footsteps inside their dwelling during the night, though no signs of forced entry will be found. In the morning children will discover presents at the foot of their beds. These will consist of toys crudely crafted from the remains of human children. See SCP-4666-A instances log below. The criteria, if any, by which SCP-4666 determines the outcome of a Weissnacht event are unknown. Document 4666-B-30091 Weissnacht Events Log Notable Weissnacht Events Location, Year, Description of Weissnacht Event Unknown Village, Croatia circa 1498. Unconfirmed. An entire family was killed, with the exception of one of the children, age unknown, who was abducted. Though specific details about the event are not available in recovered documents, it was noted that the killings presented strong paganistic elements, and that the family members had been made to suffer greatly prior to death. The Archbishop who oversaw the investigation wrote that he believed the family had been killed as part of a demonic ritual. Unknown Village, Rupert's Land, present-day Ontario, Canada 1689 Unconfirmed, an entire family was killed, with the exception of two of the children, one of whom was abducted, and one of whom, female, age unknown, escaped during the killings and was able to reach a nearby village. She told authorities that a naked man had broken into her family's dwelling during the night and proceeded to torture them, exact method not specified in recovered documents. Upon investigation, the bodies of the family members were found inside their dwelling, hanging upside down from the ceiling. All had been exsanguinated. Eichstätt, Germany 1913 An entire family was killed, with the exception of the youngest child, male age 3 who was abducted. The bodies of the parents and five other children were found inside a stable adjoining their dwelling. They had been restrained by having knives, pitchforks, and other sharp implements forced through the palms of their hands and into the walls of the stable, before having their tongues removed, leading to hemorrhaging and death. Blood from the family members had then been used to paint elaborate patterns of unknown meaning on the hides of the mule, goat, and two cows present in the stable. The animals themselves were not harmed. Neighbors told authorities that in the week preceding the killings, the father of the family had mentioned finding tracks in the snow around the family's dwelling, which appeared to have been made by bare human feet. Close Soviet Union 1956 An entire family was killed, with the exception of the youngest child, male age 4, who was abducted. The bodies of the parents and one other child were found in the living room of their house. They had been restrained, and their feet held over the flames in the fireplace for an extended period of time, calcining the tissues of the feet and exposing the bones. They had then had their heads crushed with an unknown heavy implement. Hundreds of bite marks, believed to have been inflicted post-mortem, were found on each of the bodies. Analysis of recovered police photographs have shown that the size, shape, and configuration of SCP-4666's teeth do not match those of a human being or of any known animal. Branches cut from a fir tree outside the house had also been placed over the bodies, to unknown purpose. Skudenetshaven, Norway 1971. An entire family was killed, with the exception of the second youngest child, female, age 5, who was abducted. The bodies of the parents and two other children were found in the basement of their house. Each had at least one limb pulled off by brute force before being stabbed precisely 39 times with an unknown sharp implement, possibly a piece of bone from one of the removed limbs, resulting in massive blood loss and death. The family members had then been eviscerated, and their small and large intestines removed and cut into 30 to 50 cm long pieces. These had been arranged in radiating lines around the bodies. Feces from the intestines had been used to trace symbols of unknown meaning on the walls of the basement. Eyjenstadter, Iceland 1996. 
an entire family was killed, with the exception of the youngest child, female age 4, who was abducted. The bodies of the parents and seven other children were found inside their house. All had large pieces of skin removed from their backs, necks, and groins prior to death. Removed skin was found to have been partially consumed. They had then been killed by a decapitation with a buck saw that had belonged to the family. Following death, the family members' headless bodies had been carried to their respective rooms and placed on their beds. Each of the removed heads had also been placed upright on a step of the staircase leading from the first to the second floor, with the parents' heads on the top two steps and the children's heads on the lower steps in decreasing order of age. Document 4666-B-30985 SCP-4666-A Instances Log Notable SCP-4666-A Instances Recovered Location Year Description of SCP-4666-A Instance Nermes, Finland, 1811 A small wooden drum with two wooden drumsticks of uneven length. Drum skin consists of 390cm cubed piece of skin belonging to a human child, stretched with thread made from human tendons. Gallagher Wells, 1857 A small knife, 15cm in length, blade is 6cm in length. Sculpted from a single piece of bone belonging to a human child. Symbols of unknown meaning have been carved into the handle. Makhet, Kazakhstan 1903. A flute made from the hollowed-out femur of a human child. Holes have been bored at uneven intervals along its length. The femur appears to have been dyed with human blood. Bangor, Michigan 1960. A wooden box containing thirteen miniature human-like figurines each 4-6 cm in height. Made from the phalangeal bones of human children, tied together with strips of human tendon. The figurines have been decorated with human hair and small pieces of torn clothing. DNA testing revealed that the remains belong to 18 separate children. Cape Royal, Canada 1976. A ball, 23 cm in diameter made from 19 layers of human skin wrapped tightly around the desiccated head of an unidentified human child, male, age 2-3. Layers of skin are held in place with pine resin. Bard, Netherlands, 2006 A hairbrush. The handle is made of wood and poorly carved. In place of bristles, 43 deciduous human teeth have been set at irregular intervals into the handle. DNA testing revealed that each tooth belongs to a different child. Only two of the teeth could be matched at known abduction victims of SCP-4666. Teeth vary in age from a few days to over 400 years. Discovery SCP-4666's existence and ongoing activity were first detected in 1974 through the Foundation's newly implemented Anomalous Signature Recognition Program when several highly similar home invasion incidents resulting in family deaths were found to have occurred throughout the Northern Hemisphere during the night of January 1st to the 2nd. Also known as ASRP, this program marked the Foundation's first use of algorithms as a means of detecting anomalous phenomena. Extensive research into civilian and law enforcement archives worldwide eventually uncovered evidence of probable Weissnacht events for nearly every preceding year going back to the late 18th century, average of 3.1 known events per year. Numerous historical documents were also found which appear to describe SCP-4666 activity occurring prior to this period, in some cases as early as the 2nd century AD in Europe and Russia, and as early as the 1st century BC in Scandinavia. Fingerprints belonging to the same humanoid entity have been discovered at the locations of all Foundation investigated Weissnacht events. These have been matched to a partial fingerprint found preserved in dried blood on a recovered SCP-4666-A instance, dating from 1873. The fingerprints present characteristics not known to occur in human beings. See image. Human-like white hairs were also recovered from the locations of several Weissnacht events, though no DNA human or otherwise, could be extracted from them. Addendum 4666-01 On January 2, 2018, several SCP-4666-A instances were discovered at a family's residence in Huna, Alaska, 
following the conclusion of Weissnacht Event No. 060198. Among these instances was SCP-4666-A0960, which consisted of a crude, life-sized doll made from the emaciated body of a female child, to which the following modifications had been made. A dress made from various pieces of dirty, discolored clothing had been sewn around the body, and in several places into the body's skin. The mouth had been sewn shut with thread made from human tendons, and the lips painted red with a solution consisting primarily of human blood. The fingernails of another child had been glued over the body's fingernails with pine resin. These had been painted red with the same human blood-based solution. Three of the body's fingers were missing. The entire scalp had been removed from the head, and the scalp of another child with long, blonde hair sewn onto the head in its place. The hair had been tied into two braids. Both eyes had been removed and two large round pebbles on which eyes had been crudely painted placed into the empty orbits. Upon examination by the family, the child from whom the doll had been made was found to be still alive, albeit unconscious. Authorities were notified, and the child was airlifted to Bartlett Regional Hospital in Juneau, Alaska, where she survived for 18 hours. Two Foundation agents were dispatched, and were able to interview the subject. See interview log below. Following the subject's death, her body was confiscated by the agents, and all witnesses amnesticized as per standard procedure. DNA testing revealed the subject had been Ekaterina Morozova, age 7, a known abduction victim of SCP-4666, taken from her family's residence in Dubovka, Russia, on January 2, 2016. Autopsy of the subject's body showed she had been severely malnourished during the two years following her abduction which had resulted in considerable stunting. Weight was only 15 kg, height was only 90 cm. A number of scars and burns were present on her skin, and she had suffered two bone fractures, left tibia and left ulna, that had not been reset and had healed improperly. Hands were heavily calloused. Cause of death was attributed to multiple organ failure resulting from severe, sustained malnourishment. Document 4666-V-35814 Interview Log Audio Log 4666-06201 Date January 2, 2018 Time 2327 Alaska Standard Time to 2349 Alaska Standard Time Location Bartlett Regional Hospital, Juneau, Alaska Interviewers Agent Antoni Kowalczyk Agent Susan Muse Attending Subject Ekaterina Morozova SCP-4666-A-0960 Female, age 7 Notes. The subject regained consciousness for a period of roughly 30 minutes prior to expiring, during which she was interviewed. Hospital staff had previously removed the thread that had been sewn into her lips, allowing her to speak. Despite having been administered a morphine drip, the subject was largely coherent throughout the interview. The subject did not understand English and initially spoke only a language that was unfamiliar to agents Kowalczyk and Muse. Recordings of this interview are currently being studied by the Department of Linguistics, as the language spoken by the subject was later found to match no known language, living or dead. Early indications are that it might be related to pre-Proto-Germanic. Begin Log Hello, I'm Antoni. What's your name? Are you going to take me back to him? No, I promise. I'm just here to talk to you. I don't want to go back. You don't have to. You're safe now, Mishka. Can you tell me what happened to you? Do you remember the night he came to your house? I remember. He hurt Mama and Papa and Katya and Yuliana for a long time and they were bleeding. After they stopped screaming, he put me in his bag. His bag? He had a big bag. Other children were in the bag too. I think we go to other houses. I hear people screaming outside the bag all during the night. Each house he put another child in the bag. Then after the night he takes us away. Where did he take you? Underground. 
deep. Underground? You mean in a basement? Everything earth and mud and ice. Bones everywhere. Everything cold. I can't sleep because it's too cold. Were there lots of other children there with you? Lots of children. Lots of tunnels. Lots of holes. But I can't see all. I can't see the other. Oh, 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 gee. Too dark. My hole is with Rene and Hecla and Saja and Paul. We make the toys together. The toys? If you don't make the toys, you don't eat. Don't stop making the toys. Don't fall asleep. Or he hurt you. He hurt you? How? He hit you. Or he burn you. Or he bite off your fingers. Or he cook you on the fire in his room and eat you. He ate Philippe and Sally. What about you? How did this happen to you? Did he do this? Rene and Hecla and Sasha and Paul do this. They have to. Why? I get sick. When you can't make the toys, you become the toys. End log. Item number SCP-1933 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures SCP-1933 is to be kept in a standard low-security cell, equipped with basic furnishings. It is to be provided with 2 liters of Irish whiskey, 500 milliliters of double cream, no less than 48% fat content, 25 grams of powdered sugar, and 20 milliliters of refined vegetable oil on a daily basis. As SCP-1933 is unwilling to engage in basic hygiene, it is to be forcibly stripped and showered by Level 3 personnel on a weekly basis, and its beard shaved and nails clipped on a monthly basis. Its soiled clothing is to be considered highly flammable, and is to be incinerated as a fire hazard. Description: SCP-1933 is an obese, middle-aged Caucasian male in a constant state of moderate to severe alcohol intoxication. SCP-1933's bodily fluids, including both intracellular and extracellular fluids, consist entirely of a substance identical in composition to the alcoholic beverage known as Irish cream. This substance adequately fulfills the functions of the fluids it replaces in SCP-1933's tissues despite the fact that it renders normal biochemical processes essential to life impossible. Foundation scientists have been unable to determine how it manages this. SCP-1933 subsists on a diet of cream, Irish whiskey, sugar, and refined vegetable oil, the basic ingredients of most commercially produced varieties of Irish cream. It prefers to supplement its diet with small amounts of various herbs and flavorings, usually coffee but these are not essential to its survival. It is incapable of digesting anything that is not a standard ingredient of Irish cream, including Irish cream which has been prepared beforehand. SCP-1933 will display effects consistent with acute malnutrition if its blood alcohol content significantly falls below or exceeds the range of 15-20%, the typical ABV of Irish cream. SCP-1933's bodily fluids are safe for human consumption if intake is limited to 25 milliliters or less within 24 hours. If a subject exceeds this limit, there is a significant risk that all their bodily fluids will be transformed into Irish cream. This substance does not fulfill the function of the fluids it replaces, as it does in SCP-1933. As such, it is instantly fatal. The probability that a subject's bodily fluids will be transformed into Irish cream increases by approximately 5% for each additional milliliter of SCP-1933 bodily fluids consumed. It is not known that the bodily fluids of SCP-1933's victims would have the same anomalous effects as SCP-1933's bodily fluids if they were to be consumed. Prior to containment, SCP-1933 was chronically homeless 
sleeping either on the street or in derelict buildings, wearing a Santa Claus suit at all times, stealing money with which to purchase the specific items of food and drink necessary for its survival, and collecting its bodily fluids in bottles. It would attempt to break into people's homes between 2300 December 24, Christmas Eve, and 0500 December 25, Christmas Day, and place crudely wrapped bottles of its bodily fluids alongside other wrapped presents, with the intention that they would later be unwrapped and subsequently consumed. SCP-1933 claims that this activity was motivated by a malevolent desire to give people presents, and refuses to acknowledge that its bodily fluids are fatal if consumed in large quantities. It has not been determined whether it is genuinely unaware and unwilling to accept that this is the case, or whether it is trying to conceal malicious intentions. However, the general consensus among Foundation staff who have studied SCP-1933 is that the former is more likely. Item number SCP-251 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures SCP-251 is to be kept in a locked container at all times. No one is to enter the container alone. If anyone is found to have been left alone in the container for any amount of time, they are to be treated as violently hostile and terminated with extreme prejudice. The container is to be guarded by armed personnel at all times and guards should never allow anyone, regardless of clearance level, to move the artifact or to be alone with it. Sounds of screaming, gunfire, and fires will be heard from within the container. This is normal. Description. Origin unknown. SCP-251 consistently appears to be a small snow globe. Attached is a series of photographs taken of the same artifact over time. This indicates that the snow globe is at least partially animate. However, when viewed directly by multiple people, there is no apparent movement except by a perpetual blizzard. SCP-251 has not been moved since its arrival at Site-19, but the snowflakes have never ceased falling. The scenes depicted in SCP-251 are all extremely violent or morbid, occasionally depicting something fantastical, while mostly depicting more realistic brutality. All those who have been alone with SCP-251 for any amount of time have later displayed extreme violence, xenophobia, and emotional distress. Item number SCP-3799 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures No access to Crozier Island is permitted, for either staff or civilians. The Foundation currently enforces a no-fly zone around Crozier Island, and several Foundation craft patrol the perimeter for any unwanted intruders. Any unauthorized personnel, be they civilian or staff, attempting to enter are to be issued with the appropriate amnestics to erase any unusual knowledge or interest in SCP-3799. Description: SCP-3799 is a perfect spear composed entirely of snow and with a circumference of exactly 6 meters. SCP-3799 is suspended without visible means of support at a height of 500 meters above Crozier Island, Greenland. Crozier Island is the location of Site-799, a site devoted to experimental research. Contained within SCP-3799 is SCP-3799-1, the corpse of an adult male human wearing what appears to be an unknown variant of a Foundation uniform. SCP-3799-1's right arm protrudes out of SCP-3799 and was formerly holding a number of documents which have since been recovered. The cause of death of SCP-3799-1 is believed to have been from blood loss, apparently the result of self-inflicted wounds to the wrists. Scans of SCP-3799 show that it possesses an abnormally low Hume field. Attempts to penetrate or harm SCP-3799 or SCP-3799-1 have all resulted in failure. SCP-3799 first appeared on December 24, 1987, 
during an experiment in Site-799, forming part of Project The following documents are those recovered from SCP-3799-1. They are apparently five iterations of the file for SCP-3799, although no such iterations have ever been found in the Foundation's database. Because of the sensitive information contained in these documents, their contents are restricted to the O5 Council and specifically authorized personnel only. The information contained within these documents has caused Project Midwinter to be immediately discontinued, and the present containment measures to be implemented. Document 3799-1 Item Number SCP-3799 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures no access to Crozier Island is permitted, for either staff or civilians, with the exception of the research team at Site-799. Several Foundation craft are to patrol the perimeter for any unwanted intruders. Any unauthorized personnel, be they civilian or staff, attempting to enter Crozier Island are to be issued with the appropriate amnestics to erase any unusual knowledge or interest in SCP-3799. All members of the research team at Site-799 are to remain within Site-799. Food and other necessary supplies are to be delivered to them remotely. Members of the research team are only to be allowed to remain on site for two months in any one stretch, and must take a holiday of at least one month in an area with low precipitation before being allowed to return to active duty. Any personnel exhibiting cognitohazardous symptoms thought to originate from prolonged exposure to SCP-3799-1 are to be quarantined and removed from Site-799 immediately. SCP-3799 is a meteorological phenomenon affecting Crozier Island, Greenland. The island and an area stretching 0.5 km away from it are perpetually undergoing precipitation of a substance identical to snow on a molecular level, but which displays significant anomalous properties. This substance is known as SCP-3799-1. SCP-3799-1 contains a significant cognitohazardous effect to individuals in the immediate vicinity of large quantities of SCP-3799-1, or who observe SCP-3799-1 for long periods of time. The cognitohazard causes the affected subjects to develop an obsessive interest in the substance apparently attributing to it feelings of intense joy, contentment, and enlightenment. There is currently no known way to counteract these effects. The effect does not fade over time, and in some subjects appears to have intensified. Research into a cure is ongoing. SCP-3799 first appeared on December 24, 1987, during an experiment in Site-799, forming part of Project Fourteen people were affected by SCP-3799-1 before workable containment procedures were implemented. Currently, Site-799 is to be used only for research on the SCP-3799, as well as possible ways to counter its effects. The current project lead is Dr. Simon Kells, a specialist in cognitohazardous anomalies. Addendum 3799-1 On February 8, 1991, Researchers at Site-799 reported that three personnel had gone missing since the events of December 24, 1987. It should be noted that the area of SCP-3799's effect has increased by three meters since that time. Document 3799-2 Item Number SCP-3799 Object Class Keter Special Containment Procedures Site-799 is to be evacuated as soon as possible, as there is no known way to prevent SCP-3799, and SCP-3799-1 is apparently impermeable, effective containment is presently impossible. Foundation vessels are to patrol around SCP-3799's area of effect at a distance of 3 km. Beyond personnel involved in the evacuation of Site-799, no personnel are to be allowed access to SCP-3799's area of effect. All members of the research team at Site-799 are to remain within Site-799. They are not to leave under any circumstances prior to the evacuation. Food and other necessary supplies are to be delivered to them remotely. 
Any personnel exhibiting cognitohazardous symptoms thought to originate from prolonged exposure to SCP-3799-1 are to be quarantined immediately. Several samples of SCP-3799-1 have been taken to Site-3150. Personnel are not to make direct skin contact with SCP-3799-1. All personnel must wear standard-issued hazmat suits if they wish to perform experiments involving SCP-3799-1. SCP-3799 is a meteorological phenomenon affecting an area of approximately 6 km squared, centered around Crozier Island, Greenland. This area is perpetually undergoing precipitation of a substance identical to snow on a molecular level, but which displays significant anomalous properties. This substance is known as SCP-3799-1. SCP-3799-1 contains a significant cognitohazardous effect to individuals in the immediate vicinity of large quantities of SCP-3799-1, or who observe SCP-3799-1 for long periods of time. The cognitohazard causes the affected subjects to develop an obsessive interest in the substance apparently attributing to it feelings of intense joy, contentment, and enlightenment. This leads to an eventual belief that activating SCP-3799-1's corrosive properties see below, will result in a form of transcendence, or a destruction of lower functions. The meaning of these statements is rather ambiguous and vague, with affected subjects unwilling to discuss them further. There is currently no known way to counteract these effects. The effect does not fade over time, but rather intensifies in all subjects over an extended period. Research into a cure is ongoing, but it has been found that inflicting extreme pain and or blood loss does have a delaying effect on the intensification of the cognitohazard. SCP-3799-1 possesses a corrosive property if it comes into contact with human cadavers. It gradually converts the cadaver into SCP-3799-1 by altering the subject on a molecular level. Subjects affected by SCP-3799-1's effects will feel compelled to immerse themselves in SCP-3799-1 within 48 hours of first developing symptoms, in order to expire through hypothermia and thus activate its effects. SCP-3799 first appeared on December 24, 1928 prompting the conversion of the long-abandoned Site-799 into a dedicated site for researching SCP-3799. SCP-3799's area of effect initially increased at a rate of 1 meter squared for every individual who expired due to contact with SCP-3799-1, but since 1952, it has been increasing at a rate of 1 km per expiration. Due to discrepancies in the documentation pertaining to Site-799, it is believed that Currently, Site-799 is to be used only for research on the SCP-3799, as well as possible ways to counter its effects. The current project lead is Dr. Simon Kells, a specialist in cognitohazardous anomalies. Addendum 3799-1 as of September 23, 2017, SCP-3799's area of effect appears to be increasing without a need for further human matter. The anomaly has been reclassified as Keter. Document 3799-3 Item Number Snow Object Class Pure and Free Special Containment Procedures In the spring, there is dew and water and little biting crawlers, oozing from the small places to feed and bite and eat. In the summer, there is sweat and roots and grass and seething things, the sun burning and melting the living down below, matter drying and dying. In the autumn, there is death and rot, the leaves and trees and plants decaying, the trees collapsing, the fruits bursting, pustules bleeding their sustenance into the bang starving hordes below. In the winter, there is only purity, the world is frozen, its forms filled and made whole. Snow must not contain the others. It must change. It must alter. It must make pure. Description. You cannot see the snow, can you? Not really. You just see it as a bunch of frozen ice crystals, crystalline structures made through a combination of molecules on molecules, 
which settle on the tops of houses and on the tops of trees. But those of us here at Site-799 know better. Site-799 knows that the snow is something more. The snow is pure. The snow is perfect. Look at that blizzard up at the top of the page. Examine it. There is no blood on it. No mire. It is a perfect combination of light and crystal. Reflections over reflections over reflections. Look at what it does to the buildings, to the pylon. Their differences and failings smooth over, replaced by more whole variants. The world is run by symmetry. Humans are not pure. We are composed of fetid clay and seething blood, born of mire, flowing with mud and grit through our fleshy veins, pieces of frail tissue expanding and contracting in viscous ecstasy, constantly swinging between extremes of pain and pleasure. We are complexities whose beauty is buried under layers of worn matter, frail pieces of impure skin strung together with bone and ligaments. The last of us are holed up in here. We tried to resist, but it was pointless. And I see now that there was no point. We can step into the snow. We can see the light as it should have been. Our higher functions will be given to it. Our baser forms will be reused as fuel, substance, matter. We shall be reborn as light and sound. A golden bird upon a bough. The eightfold walls of Timur's tomb, representing perfect cosmic order not made of sand and stone and cobalt, but of the intangible shapes and color of higher forms. Snow is perfection. Snow is a rejection of life, and all of its excuses and petty reasoning. Snow is true and objective and unconcerned. It's time now. To walk into the fields of white, and into my destiny. I am the last one. I resisted this nirvana, and like a bodhisattva, I stay behind to instruct others. Come, all you who labor and are heavy burdened, feed it and remove the need for feeding. I am going outside now, and may be some time. Document 3799-4 Item Number SCF-3799 Object Class Blizzard Special Containment Procedures SCF-3799 is currently uncontainable. The primary purpose of the Snow Containment Foundation is to prevent SCF-3799 from expanding further, and to find a method of neutralization. To that end, a total of 54 sites spread across all three SCF-administered zones, Tibet, Uyghuristan, and Davistan, have been established to perform research related to SCF-3799. Description. SCF-3799 is a blizzard which presently covers 28% of the world's surface. This blizzard is composed of a form of snow known as SCF-3799-1. SCF-3799-1 contains a significant cognitohazardous effect to individuals exposed to it. Exposure is defined as being in the vicinity of large quantities of SCF-3799-1 or observing SCF-3799-1 for long periods of time. The cognitohazard causes the affected subjects to develop a religious interest in SCF-3799-1, eventually worshipping it as divinely bestowed matter which will allow the individual to transcend earthly bonds. The only known way to counteract this cognitohazardous effect is through the infliction of severe pain or extreme blood loss. However, these techniques only cause a delaying effect and can never entirely erase the cognitohazard. SCF-3799-1 possesses a corrosive property if it comes into contact with human cadavers. It gradually converts the cadaver into SCF-3799-1 by altering the subject on a molecular level. Subjects affected by SCF-3799-1's cognitohazardous effects, usually within 48 hours of first displaying symptoms of cognitohazardous infection, feel compelled to immerse themselves in SCF-3799-1 displaying great enthusiasm about expiring from hypothermia and activating SCF-3799-1's effects. The source of SCF-3799 is unknown. The date of SCF-3799's initial manifestation is unknown, but it is believed to have occurred well before the evolution of modern humans. It is believed that the origin of SCF-3799 was located on the World Island located off the northwestern coast of the Danish colony of Eriksland. 
owing to its particular religious significance to cultures across the globe. The World Island is not claimed by any governmental body as territory. Until 1950, the SCF Site-799 was established on the World Island for the purposes of studying and containing SCF-3799. It is unknown when or why Site-799 was originally established, but it is believed to have existed well before extant records began in 1802. As is common knowledge, SCF-3799 is the focal point for the vast majority of the world's religions, particularly Aspirianity and the cult of the White Prophet. Knowledge of SCF-3799 is public, and large numbers of religious groups have been sacrificing individuals to SCF-3799 since time immemorial. As is commonly known, virtually all political and economic developments in human history have been centered around SCF-3799 and ways to best provide enough fuel for its continued growth. Despite often contradictory evidence, it is believed that SCF-3799 significantly altered the timeline of human history. This is due to several unexplained elements of world history, including but not limited to the lack of any cultural exchange between the indigenous peoples of the Americas and those of Afro-Eurasia, despite many centuries of both groups visiting the world island for religious purposes. The continued existence of the Davite civilization, despite ample documentation describing its downfall. It is believed that SCF-3799's anomalous effects help mitigate the strength of the Davite's potential rivals. The tribes of Croatia in particular are known to have had their manpower depleted many times by sacrifices to SCF-3799. Why Site-799 is named thus, despite it being the oldest SCF base by many centuries. The existence of the 33 anomalies currently contained by the Snow Containment Foundation, despite the containment of SCF-3799 having always been its sole mission. The existence of the Snow Containment Foundation itself, as there are no records of any individuals opposed to SCF-3799's existence, or who have demonstrated anything other than total devotion to SCF-3799. Several documents referring to an SCP Foundation despite no such organization ever having existed. The continued existence of the human race, given the number of individuals thought to have expired with an SCF-3799 over the last 5,000 years. It is believed that the Snow Containment Foundation's files on SCF-3799 have been tampered with multiple times due to individuals affected by SCF-3799-1. Addendum 3799-1 on June 14, 2017, Snow Containment Foundation researchers detected a large energy signature from a point exactly 500 meters above the former Site-799. Because of the apparent changes in the timeline caused by SCF-3799, it is theorized that Addendum 3799-2 Why are we even trying? It's up to 44% now, and it's only been a few weeks. How did this thing start? When did it start? What are we even still doing alive? Maybe we should just give up, walk outside, freeze ourselves. Maybe that is our only purpose, to become fuel. Addendum 3799-3 I don't think there are many of us left. There's only Site-112 and Site-3150 now. One of those houses small aircraft, and the other one is where I am, and everyone else here has walked outside. I don't understand what I'm reading. I don't know what any of these people and civilizations are. The human race has been contained within the sites forever. That's all there's ever been. The snowfall and the foundation. What does this all mean? Document 3799-5 This was the final document recovered from SCP-3799-1. Based on the contents, it is believed to have been written by SCP-3799-1 himself during the final hours of his life. Item number, fucked if I can remember. Object class, Apollyon or Blizzard or White, I don't even know anymore. Special Container Procedures We're trying to stop it, and we think we know how. Description So it won't sodding stop. We tried everything. We tried sacrifice and ritual and setting things on it and they all died. We got nothing left, but we worked it out in the end and now I am on the way to fix it. There's this point that's miles and miles up, and it's where this comes from. It's got some weird time shit in it, 
That's what that idiot Kells and his mates keep doing in some old reality, and now it exists everywhere. It's an idea. An idea they made that's eating up the present and the past and everything, changing it, changing history, making everything boring and uniform and oh so fucking pretentious. And it was us who did this shit. We made it. They were trying to get rid of all the anomalies that ever were, to stop the world dying a new death every other day, have some quiet days back. But it didn't work. This is what Kells did. All that time we turned a blind eye to him. They wanted a world where they didn't have to work for their supper. They wanted purity, and they got purity. Fuck it. I haven't got a fucking clue what was real before. All I know is that it didn't work. Because that's not what life is. We're made of blood and mire and fucking and the sweet taste of wine. The scent of wheat and fields back home. Life. This thing isn't life. This thing is free of our useless imperfections. Some robot thing using our heads to create its pretentious fucking beauty. It can't write a poem, cause it thinks art is all imagery and airy-fairy fuckery. Art is life. Shakespeare grew hot for fuck's sakes. We live and we die and we glory in that fucking creation, and this thing wants to take all that and chop it up and make it into a bunch of straight lines and calculus. Well, fuck that. I'm going into it. Into its source where it first came from. I'm going to bleed myself into its belly and stopping from having ever worked. I'm going to pilot this craft into the hardest thing, covering my eyes and skin, and then when I'm right in the belly I'll cut myself and give it what it hates. Blood. Life stuff. Full of fuel and waste. It'll hate that. It hates blood and mire. It won't be able to cope. All the changes, all the shit it's done in time and space will be cut off at the source. This is my last testament. I've got all the copies of this thing, all the iterations gathered up. I reached into the archives, into the places where the snow hadn't done its job properly, and took these ghosts. These voices of what once was, and now never was. I'll take them with me, and if I survive the CK-class shit, maybe someone will find them. The world that was. The world that those fuckers created. Remember us. Item number SCP-649 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures SCP-649 is to be kept closed in a standard containment locker, located within Site-77. It should not be opened unless testing is being performed. SCP-649 is not to be moved from its containment chamber unless testing is being performed. In case of a containment failure, Heating implements should be placed in the cell to inhibit SCP-649's effect. SCP-649 is a diamond brand matchbox, containing standard 32 match count. It has a mark on the underside of the box, resembling a snowflake. Whenever SCP-649 is left open for more than 15 minutes, or one of its matches is struck, its anomalous properties will manifest. Note that striking a match does not light it or appear to alter it in any way. The area SCP-649 is held in will experience a sudden decrease in temperature, followed by strong winds. These winds will still develop as the item is indoors. When the temperature in the area SCP-649 inhabits reaches zero degrees Celsius, SCP-649 will begin to exude large amounts of snow and sleet in a manner similar to SCP-2082. In addition, SCP-649's area of effect will rapidly increase to a radius of 1 km. The sleet and snow will be continuously produced by SCP-649 until the entire radius is covered by snowfall at least 3 meters deep with a temperature below negative 30 degrees Celsius. SCP-649's area of effect will expand at a rate of 15 meters an hour continuously. In addition, tundra-like conditions will develop near the epicenter of SCP-649's effect expanding at the same rate. The temperature within SCP-649's radius will stay at a constant negative 45 degrees Celsius. This effect will continue indefinitely, with the only known means of halting the expansion of the area of effect being to close SCP-649's lid. SCP-649 was discovered on April 19, 1987, from 
West Virginia. Reports had reached Foundation operatives indicating that the town was experiencing blizzard conditions, which prompted investigation. SCP-649 was found in the center of the town, within a cemetery. Agents were able to contain SCP-649 on June 16, 1987, classifying it as Euclid. Amnestics were dispersed to local citizens, and a cover story blaming the incident on global warming disseminated. Addendum 649-A SCP-649 was left open for approximately 1 hour and 48 minutes. After 1 hour and 45 minutes, children's laughing could be heard, and a snowball hit Dr. Pina. Silhouettes of small forms could be seen through the fog. Three D-Class personnel were sent to investigate. When they did not return after an additional 20 minutes, SCP-649 was closed and containment protocol initiated. The D-Class personnel had not been recovered. When the tape was replayed, one of the D-Class could be seen led by small figures through the walls of the test chamber. Records on the missing personnel indicate all three, one male, two female, had had children who had died before adolescence. All testing with such personnel has been suspended.